Greetings, everyone. Gleekon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. On our last episode, we did some more Dark Shore quests and puttered around, which was which was cool. Uh, it was a good running around with our druid. We did some fishing. We did some uh, just general questing. It was kind of hard for me to actually, more so than I've had for almost any other episode, to really geographically tie down. Because Darkshore kind of just has us going up and down Darkshore and doing different things more by level. Um, and there's plenty to do. We've also been reading the Horde Player's Guide in addition to playing Classic. And this is the Dungeons & Dragons source book. Um, there's only a few left after this one. We're almost done with this one. I'd say we are within the final five episodes of this book. Um, we're going to have... I could we, could... we could be sit, do six, but the next two parts of this chapter are very short. So we're going to bust out both right now, uh, but we're not going to finish the chapter because the last one's pretty long. It's probably going to take about a half an hour or 40 minutes to get through. Um, and then each of the final three chapters in this book after that are really Dungeons and Dragons like uh, stats heavy. So we can probably just do one episode per chapter to wrap up the rest of the book. Um, so stay a while. Last time what we did was we looked at the Horde leaders. Stay a while and listen as we... Now, look at a couple other things. We're going to start with politics and relationships among the races. This is almost like a sidebar. <clears throat> For a brief time... <laughs> I think this dog. I, I'm telling you guys. He waits until I start the videos before he starts chasing his tail. He's clicking around the floor chasing his tail. So, um... It's like he hears my voice in this certain tone that means it's time to start f filming the show. And then he just starts whirling around like King Dingus. Okay. For a brief time, the Horde was united. Trolls, Orcs, and Torin stood proudly together and learned from each other. Their shared shamanistic beliefs brought these three races close together after the end of the Third War... And Warchief Thrall taught the trolls of the Echo Isles less violent ways to worship the ancient springs of their ancestors, spirits of their ancestors. The assaults of Admiral Dalen Proudmoore taxed the Horde's military strength, but served to strengthen their ties with each other, as well as other groups such as the Ogres of Dustwallow. Rexar, the champion of the Horde, was integral both in bringing allies to the Horde and defeating the usurped forces of Theramor. In the aftermath, the Horde was strong, in some senses the strongest they had ever been. A number of more recent problems have cut gaping wounds in this affiliation's body, however. It was only recently that the leaders of the Horde permitted Lady Sylvanas Windrunner, Windrunner and her Forsaken to join them, much to the shock and disappointment of many of the most spiritual of Thrall's followers. Some have deserted the Horde out of disgust for this alliance of convenience. Others have embraced it and joined with the Forsaken in the pursuit of foul magic and poison. I asked Thrall if he regretted his decision to admit the Forsaken into the Horde, and he seemed to have mixed feelings on the subject. Clearly, the Warchief has no affection for these cunning corpses, but with the Alliance's aggression increasing, he knew his people were in desperate need of allies. It is clear that the Warchief expects to be stabbed in the back. He simply knows that Sylvanas still finds their situation convenient enough to maintain. The Tauren and Trolls follow the Warchief with great loyalty, but they do not necessarily agree with his judgment. The Tauren, with the notable exception of the Grim Totem tribe, consider the Forsaken abominations, much like all other undead. Which is weird that the Grim Totem are the most xenophobic, and yet they're the ones that are most willing to work with the undead. Karen feels his people owe the Orcs a debt of honor. <clears throat> which is one of the only things that keeps him from outwardly speaking against this relationship. In general, however, the Tauren get along with the orcs well, and the trolls almost as well. There's still a bit of distrust for the Dark Spears, knowing that they only recently abandoned voodoo and cannibalism. The trolls are a mixed bag. Some are just as critical of the undead as the Tauren. Others find the walking dead fascinating. The shadow priests among the trolls find the forsaken to be kindred spirits, minus the whole spirit part. Of the other races of the Horde, the Trolls are the least quick to judge the Forsaken. Part of this is probably because they're so used to being stereotyped as evil themselves. In some cases, they support the Forsaken because they are evil. However, it's important to keep in mind that the entire Darkspear tribe didn't give up their culture overnight, however things might appear. 
There are clearly a number of trolls who side with the Horde for convenience, much like the Forsaken do, without abandoning their old beliefs. As one might expect, the viewpoints of the trolls about the Orcs and Torin vary. Some see these other races as friends and mentors, others as fools to be used. Vol'jin, fortunately, is of the former belief, and the majority of the trolls are willing to follow his leadership and listen to his wisdom. I've talked a lot about how the other races don't care much for the Forsaken, but it's important to remember their perspective on things, too. I'll admit I can't speak for Lady Sylvanas as well as I can for the other leaders, seeing as I didn't really have a chance to interview her, but it wasn't difficult, surprisingly, to get a few of her people to sit down and share their feelings on the other races. It's also interesting and classic when you go talk to the leaders. Sylvanas is like the only one you can't really talk to. Interestingly, a few of them seem to genuinely like the Horde. They see the Horde as a group of outcasts, which is something the Forsaken can respect. These few legitimate Horde supporters also tend to focus on the sides of the Horde they like. You know, the good stuff like Warlocks and the Grim Totem tribe. The majority of the Forsaken I spoke to, however, were fairly open in their contempt. It's a miracle the Horde even allows some of these people in their cities. It sounded to me as if many were just waiting for the best chance to poison Orgrimmar. In spite of all the issues with the Forsaken, the Horde is generally as or more united and cooperative than the Alliance in many respects. You'll see Orcs, Trolls, and Torin training together on a regular basis. It's something I mention frequently because I admire that sort of thing. On a military level, it's not difficult to get the three living races to work together as a unit. After all, they practically live on top of each other. The Alliance has the disadvantage of having its two largest centers of power separated by the ocean, whereas few of the Horde expect or rely on the Undercity for support. That makes the Horde somewhat more self-sufficient, at least on Kalimdor. I'd like to see the Alliance learn a bit from their example. Okay, and then we're also going to read about lands and resources. <clears throat> The Horde controls lands across Azeroth, so Kalimdor, which is, I would say, their main base of operations. Central Kalimdor is easily the most Horde-dominated part of the world. You could hardly walk 10 feet without tripping over a Torrent in the Barrens these days. Not that tripping over a Torrent is a wise idea, mind you. Durotar is the Horde's ultimate base of operations, and from there Thrall leads his people, but Durotar and the surrounding areas are fairly devoid of natural resources. The Horde has been forced to plunder nearby Ashenvale for usable wood, much to the irritation of the native Night Elves, and they've been forced to compete with the Dwarves for high-quality ore and stone in the Barrens and Mulgore. Fresh water is a precious resource in central Kalimdor. Small pools dot the land, but there are few major bodies of water. Desolus and everything further south is up for grabs at this point. Neither the Alliance nor the Horde has a strong presence in Tenaris, for example. The Horde still outnumbers the Alliance in southern Kalimdor, and here they can actually gather lumber, fish, and the like without much competition, but there are no major establishments yet due to interference from native creatures. Hippogriffs and ogres dominate much of Feralis, not to mention corrupted green dragons in the far north near the Twin Colossals. The Sandy Lands, as I call them, Tanaris, Silithus, and the Shimmering Flats, have almost no major resources to speak of, but the Ungoro Crater's power crystals could be immensely valuable. Neither the Alliance nor the Horde has set up anything major in that area yet, however. It's important to know that the Horde imports some resources through southern Kalimdor. Steam Weedle Steam Port in Tanaris is neutral, and one of the best places to get exotic goods from the South Seas. Northern Kalimdor has many resources desired by the Horde, such as ample gold, lumber, and in some cases fresh water. This is perhaps why it remains one of the most hotly contested areas in the world. The Night Elves are dominant here, but a group of orcs pushes their way north from the Barrens, much to the dismay of the Alliance. This is one of many situations where an agreement could probably be reached, but no one bothers. The Horde needs lumber, the Alliance wants to keep the trees alive, so the Alliance could just give the Horde some wood extracted by their wisps. Seems simple enough to me. Beyond the Warsong Lumber Mill, the Horde doesn't have much in northern Kalimdor. There's a small encampment in Felwood dedicated to getting rid of corruption in the forest, those guys have the right idea, and another camp in Ajara. Ajara is littered with magical objects, or at least Azura goes to blue, the blue thinks so. A number of powerful adventurers search the ruins of ancient cities here for both magical and mundane objects, but beyond that, Ajara isn't that strong by way of resources. The Horde could probably gather some lumber here with less harassment than they get elsewhere, however. Some parts of Ajara are still inhabited by Naga, ghosts, and worse, but others seem almost completely abandoned. 
okay, Northrend in the South Seas. I'll touch on Northrend only briefly to acknowledge its existence. The Horde has essentially nothing there, nor would it be safe to import anything. There are rumors that Lady Sylvanas Windrunner is setting up a forsaken city up there somewhere, but I don't buy it. I was up there pretty recently myself, and I didn't see anything of the sort. There are a few Tauren camps scattered among the snows, but beyond that, don't expect to see a Horde presence in Northrend. The Alliance forces here would probably be more friendly than elsewhere, however, simply because they're so used to dealing with the cold and the dead. I'm sure seeing any other living creature would be refreshing for most of those poor bastards. The situation in the South Seas is similar, but not quite as grim. The Alliance and the Horde simply haven't touched that area yet. There are a few ambassadors and undermine in Zandalar, but that's about it for now. The Eastern Kingdoms. The Horde's presence in the Eastern Kingdoms isn't particularly strong because their main city there is stuck in the middle of the undead-infested Turistful Glades. I'm talking about Undercity under here. And they haven't managed to put up anything else that's much bigger than a single fortress. The Forsaken are strong in the north, but they care little about mortal resources. Rather, Sylvanas' followers gather herbs and other supplies for their alchemical research. The Forsaken aren't far from the valleys of Alterac, however, where many proud orcs, formerly members of the Frostwolf clan, reside. These orcs, though separated from Durotar, remain strong under the leadership of Drek'thar, but they've recently come into conflict with the Stormpike dwarves over the resources in the area, mostly gold, steel, and other types of metal. The fighting in this region is intense. Only a stone's throw away the Forsaken assault the League of Arathor at Refuge Point, trying to steal what little is left of value from the people of Stromgard. In the Hillsbrad foothills, Taran Mill, once a human town, is under Horde control now, and the Alliance constantly sends troops from South Shore to retake it. And so the bloody perpetual battle continues. I think that's alluding to some of the PvP zones. The Horde's other establishments is in the Eastern Kingdoms are few and fairly spread out. A small town called Kargath operates in the western side of the Badlands, frequently coming into conflict with the dwarves who have lived nearby for centuries. And I'm not just talking about Ironforge dwarves here. The Dark Iron Dwarves have a strong presence in the Searing Gorge and near Uldaman, so Kargath is struck, stuck right between the two groups. Kargath, as I understand it, is primarily a military establishment. There's a lot of mining to be done in the Badlands, but that's about it. Further south, the Horde has less and less. You'll find a Horde settlement in the Swamp of Sorrows, a tower in eastern Duskwood, and a small city in Stranglethorn. That's pretty much it, actually. None of these provide much for the Horde, with the exception of Stranglethorn, where the Horde has an easier time than the Alliance at conducting trade with the Goblins of Booty Bay. Additionally, the Horde has one of few operational Zeppelin platforms there, and that allows for easy transportation of goods. Overall, the Eastern Kingdoms are an investment for the Horde. They put in more than they get out of it at this point. The only way I could see that changing is if relations improve with the Alliance because there's simply too much competition for, well, everything there right now. All right, cool. So we have another episode in the pipe, five by five. We've talked about the political relationships, the lands, and the resources, and all we have left is one more to talk about the kind of the state of the Horde. And then we will wrap up with the last few chapters. I think we're going to do um, the last few are, are general stat blocks. Um, we're going to talk about the different troops of the Horde, but from a stat perspective, uh, we'll do a mini monsters manual for any new Horde-related creatures, and then wrap it up with a couple adventures, which we've done that in the past on one of our other books, too. Okay, cool. Thank you, everybody, so much for watching and listening. You know I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you tune in next time. See ya on Lore of Warcraft.